I'm Jerry Weaver. I'm an alcoholic. Amen. My sobriety date is July the 2nd, 1989. And um, I had to get that in there. Uh, home group is a group called There is a Solution. We meet in Cary Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. It's a good group. Got a bunch of home group members that rode with us, a couple of prospects. And um, I, I appreciate y'all uh, coming with me. It's uh, a good home group. It's hard to beat. It, it really is. And uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, very appreciative of, of my group. Thanks for asking me to come speak. I, I, uh, I don't know how many, I guess I'm the January speaker. Um, um, it's, it's happened quite often here. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's an honor to be asked back continually for, uh, for anything. I was, uh, I was thinking, so um, 35 years ago, kind of to the day, I had, um, I had stumbled into a church about four weeks before that, as a matter of fact, it was on January the 1st. I'd been uh, out drinking for about 10 or 11 days with two other guys. And we just rode the roads and we would hang out in the streets or out in the woods. And I rolled into that church that January, the morning of January the 1st, not knowing I was alcoholic, but I knew that I wanted some help. I, just, I was just tired of how my life was going and was just absolutely as people would call it nowadays, depressed and anxious and just in darkness. And, but didn't know what was wrong with me. And they did some stuff with me that morning in that church. And I really thought that my life was just automatically gonna change. Now, I don't know why I thought that. Nobody told me that. And nothing changed. <laughs> but a, a, a not long after that, sometimes towards the end of January, early February, I went, me and my wife talked me into going to marriage council. Now, I thought we were going actually for marriage council. <laughs> but we get there, and this, I don't know if it was a psychiatrist or a therapist or a counselor, but one of those, I wouldn't have known the difference back then. We get in there, and they want to talk about my drinking. And... Prior to that, no one other than my father-in-law had really ever said anything about, about my drinking. It was more of, man, you need to get your life in order. And a lot of my family would never mention my drinking because then they'd have to look at their drinking. Um, but this was like the first time that, that anybody had said anything to me. And I'm like, you guys are crazy. There's nothing wrong with my drinking. It, the problem is you. The problem is you all. <laughs> And the problem is the Air Force and the, the state of North Carolina and the way I was raised. And, uh, you know, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with my drinking. Anyway, it didn't go very well. The session ended early. <laughs> and I, I mean, I left. And not long after that, my wife left. And we would do this vicious cycle of her leaving, coming back. She'd leave. And then she would come back. I know now that she was sleeping with my cousin and she was sleeping with a bouncer from the Long Branch called Jungle. <laughs> Did y'all have that one down? Yeah. And, uh, the, uh, they're taking bets on what stories I'm going to tell tonight. So some, one of them just won a dollar. The, uh, the, and it was, just, it was just a chaotic life. And in a chaotic time, the, the, the six months in there before I got sober, and what, what happened to me was I would make promises to my wife. It'd be a promise like, hey, I'm coming straight home from work. And I would leave Pope Air Force Base with the idea of going straight home. And what would happen is my, my mom would start telling me to stop and get a beer, or I would, dry, I would drive by the barracks before I left the base and visit with somebody that I worked with. And, Inevitably, I would start drinking with the intent of just drinking a few and going home. I mean, I wouldn't think of it that way, but that's what it was. I'm just, yeah, I'll have a few and then I'm going to head on to the house. And it would typically be two or three in the morning before I'd get home, or it could be two or three days later, depending on the situation. And there were many, many times where I'd go home with my fatigues on, get there about two or three in the morning, and the wife, my wife would be in bed. 
after, you know, I've made a few phone calls and lied to her about what I was doing. And sometimes the sheets would be wet where she'd, be, where she'd been crying because, you know, I didn't come home and I, and I lied to her. And I would lay down in the bed there with my uniform on and just, like, stay stiff. And we would both just lay there and not even not talk to one another. And it was just, it was very, very uh, just, it was awful. And I'd pop up about 6 in the morning to make roll call at 7. And I would write write notes to her apologizing and making all these other promises. Sometimes I'd get her lipstick and write on the mirror there in the bathroom, I, I love you and I'm sorry. It was just so dramatic and it was awful actually. And I'd get to Pope Air Force Base and I'd basically been up for a day or two and just just be awful. And I would go into, I would show up for roll call just paranoid as, as all get out, thinking, man, they're gonna find out Today's the day they're going to find out and they're going to, they're going to get me. And I'd get through roll call and the heat, I'd, the heat was never on me. All this stuff is just stuff in my mind. And then I'd, I'd get off a of roll call and I'm like, man, I'm in good shape now. And we'd get down to the hangar and start working on airplanes. And the 10, 11 o'clock, all that fear and all those promises I made, they would just wear off. And the next thing I'm thinking is like, man, boy, beer would be good. I mean, and, and, you know, I would inevitably go leave, go to lunch and start drinking. And the, the cycle would start all back over. And around this time, I was still involved in that church. And I would go around and preach to people at work. And I'd carry that new, they gave me a little pocket New Testament. And I would carry that around with me and. Uh, I'd pull it out on break and read it, and I just thought if people could see me reading it, that they would think that things were good and that I was doing good. And and I would like I would tell them about how I turned my life over and that things were good. And you guys, you know, I was I was basically testifying. I was doing what the preacher at the Free Will Baptist Church was telling me to do. I was I was I was carrying the message. <laughs> and I would tell these guys all these things that they were doing wrong and what they needed to do and. They would just look at me and, you know, say, yeah, whatever. And, and then I'd go out in the parking lot to my car. After, you know, testifying and preaching to these guys, I'd go out in the car and pop some Percocets and take a swig of that vodka or that Thunderbird that wine that I had out there and then go back in there and work on airplanes. And it was just this full flight from reality, as, as, the, as the literature says. And... You know, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I mean, I knew there was a lot wrong with me, but I just, I didn't know I had alcoholism. I didn't, I mean, I didn't know anything about it. I'd never heard anything about Alcoholics Anonymous. And around all this, the same time, I'm, uh, uh, I shaved my head. I thought that shaving my head was, was, um, was going to fix me. I thought that would keep me sober. Peter's tried it. It didn't work very well for him, but, uh, <laughs> And I would read books, and the church would give me these books, and I would read these books, and I would listen to gospel music on the radio, and I would, I think somehow that was going to change me. I didn't even pray, would, would pray. And, man, I, you can, you can drink while you're praying, I can tell you that. And you can, you can, yeah, you can pray after you drink. Um, and I just didn't, I mean, I didn't know what, what, what was wrong with me. I, and I would do things like, the, the, there was two guys that I worked with that drank like I did. We would all, we would drink during lunch. And we'd come back to work all tore up and work on airplanes. And <laughs> we would cover for each other. And one of them was, was, was my boss. And he was like in charge of the work we were doing. And this one guy, we would go to his like house and drink at lunch. And then we'd come back to work. And I started preaching to this guy, and he said, hey, you want to go to the house and get something to eat? And I'm like, yeah, but you know I quit drinking. And he said, yeah, I know, it's not, not a problem. I mean, it wasn't a problem to him at all. Well, on the way to his house, he's driving, and I'm laying, I'm laying it on him thick about what he needs to do and what I've done and all these things I'm going to do. And he's just kind of nodding his head, and, you know, I've, I've quit drinking. I'm never going to drink again. And he's like, yeah, that's good, Jerry. And he, we got to his house, and I swear, we walked into his kitchen, and he says, hey, Jerry, you want a beer? And I said, yeah, I'll have just one. <laughs> and, 
I would, that's alcoholism. I would do stuff like that and just no thought of, you know, of what was going on. And what happened was um, my, um, my wife left again. It looked like she wasn't coming back. And I, I basically started, I'm still in the Air Force. I started kind of living like an animal, living two or three different lives, depending on who I'm hanging out with. And I, um, I attempted suicide three times. And the, to me, it wasn't like a big deal. I just, I just wanted to disappear. I wanted to check out. I thought that people would be better off without me. And, and looking back on it, they probably still would have been better off without me at the time, if the truth was told. Um, but I, uh, I had this dog that had mange. And this was, um, you know, I had given up on the church. Matter of fact, that, that church tried to help me big time. And after about three or four months of being involved with them, I started blaming them for all the problems I was having. But they did nothing. I probably would not be alive if it wasn't for some of the members of that church. So I'm not making fun of them. Or I know it sounds like it sometimes, but I, I'm deeply grateful for the, some of those men there that helped me. And as a matter of fact, I'm so selfish that the pastor of that church was like counseling me for a little while. And he, he missed an appointment because a, a member of the church had died. And I took offense to that and never went back. That's, that's what the book talks about, selfish and self-centered. That, that's the truth there. And um, anyway, I, uh, I had this dog that had mange, and the vet had given me this poison to kill the mange on the dog. And I had this bright idea, well, if it kills mange, maybe it'll kill a man. And I had been out with... Um, it's funny, I don't know why this just popped. I had been out that night with these two, two folks that I went to high school with. And um, matter of fact, one of those girls, I never, it was a, there was a girl and a guy, I never thought that girl was gonna make it. She's now an attorney and just helped me get out of a speeding ticket. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> got it reduced, so she, she made it. But uh, anyway, uh, they dropped me off back at the house that night, and I went into the house, and man, I was just, I was just done. And I pulled some of that mange poison up into a syringe and shot it up my arm. And laid down on the kitchen floor there, this house that I'm getting ready to lose. It, it may have been infested with fleas at that time, I can't remember, but I had this whole cocker spaniel. I had a cocker spaniel that lived inside, and the dog with the mange lived outside. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, the... Uh, I went away from here for a little while. I won't go into a whole lot of detail about that other than um, I didn't want to come back when they were reviving me. And I, um, I came back. I was in the hospital for, I think it was five days. And while I was in the hospital, recovering from that, my arm had swelled up. I had cellulitis in my arm and it was, it was, it was awful. I was in a civilian hospital under my, one of my brother's names and my family was hiding it from the Air Force and lying to people and there was all kinds of things around it. And I can remember getting out of, before getting out of the hospital, having a discussion with my dad, there's no way I could go back to living that way. And I meant that. And any you know, outsider looking in would say, well, man, there's no way he's gonna go back to, to living like that after going through that experience. And I, I actually thought I had like some spiritual awakening. You ever, you, you, sometimes you see movies or shows or read books where you know the guy was at down and out and something happened and like an angel visits him and then he becomes an angel or he goes out. And uh, I mean, I guess that eventually kind of happened. But I, I thought that since I, you know, it appeared I died and came back to life that man, I'm going to, you know, things are just going to be cr crazy good. I was out of the hospital for three days and went right back to drinking with no thought of what happened eight days before that. 
there was no conscious effort to not drink or, I mean, well, I did have a couple of voices in my head telling me it probably wasn't a good idea. And I justified it by, by talking myself into, if I, I convinced myself if I ate a Slim Jim, there's your Slim Jim, Eddie. And uh, if I ate a Slim Jim and drank the eight ounce beers instead of the bigger beers, that things would be different. It'd be all right. And that's what I did. And I was off to the races. And I, I ended up getting uh, discharged out of the Air Force not long after that. And I really thought that my life was just going to start getting better once I got out of the Air Force. I thought the Air Force was part of the problem. And that getting under that, that, that thumb of rule or that, all that discipline was going to help me. Actually, I look now, it actually helped me <laughs> being under all that. Because when I got discharged out of the Air Force in the May in 1989, I went downhill extremely quickly. I was living like an absolute animal. And my wife had just disappeared by this time. I don't know where she's at, what she's doing. And what happened was I, I, um, I went, I wouldn't say I came to, but I kind of came out of a, I don't know what, what you'd call it, in this house that I'm getting ready to lose. And there's an older dude in there. His name was Squirrel Man. That gives you any idea of, <laughs> he drove one of those big old Buick station wagons. <laughs> and there was a girl, a young girl in there in the house. And I, I was trying to piece together what happened and it wasn't a good situation at all. And I left my house. I was so disgusted with myself and what had happened that I left, I just left the house, started walking. And I can remember I walked uptown, I'm living in Coates, and I, I walked uptown to this, to the, a convenience store called the Easy Shop, where everybody went, and my father-in-law was pumping gas when I was kind of walking up to the store, and I can remember he just kind of looked over at me and just went like, this just look of disgust. It was awful. And something happened to me. And I, that led to borrowing a car, the, the, the Volkswagen that I had, the motor had blowed up in it by this time, so I'm just kind of walking and bumming rides and borrowing vehicles. I did steal a car from my stepmom. She didn't like that too good. Um, but I went and borrowed a car from this guy named Shaggy. And we called him Shaggy because he looks like Shaggy on the, the Scooby-Doo cartoon, if you ever watched that. And, uh, I made a 12-step call on him years later. He never did get sober. Um, but I borrowed a car from him, and I drove back to the house, and that squirrel man and that girl were gone. And I pulled that car into this little garage that was there at the house and left the car running and laid down by the exhaust pipe and started sucking on the pipe, trying to kill myself. And I came to a little while later in the backyard. The back door of the garage was open. The car was still running. And I'm kind of disoriented and just not in good shape at all. Not in good shape at all. And I can remember going, getting the car turned off and going in the house and sitting there on the couch and thinking, look at what you people have done to me. It's just so just bizarre. Delusion. Blaming it on other people. And I would listen to these old blues, these old, if you ever listen to old Eric Clapton blues and Jimmy Reed. I would sit there and I would cry and just, it was just awful. Yeah, and uh, about, uh, I don't know, a week or two later, I, I um, came to the guy's house. As a matter of fact, I've never t I don't think I've ever told this, probably shouldn't tell it. That, the, the, the night before that, I went to my cousin's house and my wife was there and him and her were in the back bedroom. Now there was a, there were, there was a, <laughs> this confirms my suspicions. <laughs> there was kind of a, I forgot about this until there was like a, there, he was having a party and um, she was in the back room and he was back there with her and I can remember people were trying to keep me from going back there. I never did go back there. And, um, but I'm pretty sure that confirmed what I was thinking. 
And I left there, and um, Shaggy came, and I think he picked me up, and we went back to my house. And I can remember saying a few words to him, and he was trying to calm me down. And I ended up going, I ended up leaving, and ended up at this guy's house in Benson. Came to the next morning, and basically had just kind of given up on life, and I just, I mean, it was just, Things just weren't a big deal to me anymore. I was just going to kind of go on to the bitter end. I'd kind of made a decision. I was going to leave her alone. And I, I was walking to the grocery store to go write a bad check. They kept cashing them, so I kept writing them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> back then, it would take them a long time to catch up with you. And you could float checks for a long time. It was awesome. Uh, of course, when you finally got paid or got money, you were broke. But you could you could float float pretty good there for a while, and uh, anyway, I was on the I I was walking. It was about an eight mile walk, and I was going to hitchhike when I got to 27 Highway in the town. And as I was walking down the road that morning, it was like my whole life flashed before my eyes, and I I had this this kind of moment of clarity. Still don't know what's wrong with me. But I had this moment of clarity where, man, I just like, it was clear that I needed some help. And I don't know what I need help with, but I need help. And I said, there's got to be something better than this. And I said, God, please help me. And when I said, when I said, God, please help me. And it's about six in the morning, best I can remember. I looked over and there's this little... I call it a shack. It's a little house on the side of the road. And the front door was open, but there was a screen door there. And I kind of looked in right after I said, God, please help me. I looked in, and there was a lady sitting in a rocking chair in there. And the next thing I know, I'm up on the front porch asking her if I can use the phone. Now, I can tell you that wasn't me. I would have never gone up on somebody's front porch and asked if I could use the telephone. And I, she, she let me in. And I called my dad. And my dad answered. And him and his wife and their kids were getting ready to go to the beach for vacation. They were like getting ready to leave. And I asked him if he'd come pick me up. And my stepmom was in the background telling him, don't go get him. And she was still pissed off. I had, I had stolen that car from her not long before that. <laughs> And, and uh, she went out to go to work, and the car was gone. I was like, no. Nah. And then back then, what I would have said something like, hey, well, you shouldn't have left the key in it. I mean, if you didn't want anybody to take it, right? I mean, uh, that's the arrogance that, that we have. I mean, that's not the right thing to say, by the way. That's just. And anyway, he came, he, he came and he picked me up. And when, when I got in the car with him, the first thing out of my mouth was, I need some help. And it was like, I can remember when I said that, it was like this burden had lifted off my shoulders. And they were, they were waiting for that moment where I actually asked for help. And he took me to a detox in North Raleigh. And some, things, some funny things happened when I was in that detox. This guy came in and did an assessment on me and I told him the truth. I'd never said, I had never told the truth in my life. Looking back, I don't think it, I could have actually done that. I mean, something had to have happened for me to be able to actually verbalize the truth. And I, uh, I ended up writing a bad check that morning. So I got, I mean, I don't have any money. I don't have any insurance. I've just been discharged out of the Air Force. I mean, I didn't have anything, but they asked me if I had insurance. I was like, yeah, I got insurance. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I guess I wasn't completely honest, huh? And I gave them this fake insurance number. And I wrote them a bad check for $500 to get into the detox. And that was back when the, the, these treatment centers were charging forty or $50,000, you know, to, to stay for four weeks. And you get, the, the joke was you got a $40,000 big book. And because uh, that's what happened when they discharged you, you left with a big book. And but anyway, I, I lied and wrote a bad check and got in. And while I was in the detox, a guy from AA came and talked to me. He took time out of his schedule on a Sunday morning to come in there and talk to me. 
There's probably 50 other things he could have been doing, like playing golf or going to church or hanging out with his family, um, fishing. I don't know. Um, but I thank God he wasn't at his kid's soccer game. He came in there and talked to me. And I've been sober ever since. And when he came in, all he did was he talked about himself. He didn't ask me a bunch of questions. He didn't ask me how I was doing. <laughs> the stupidest <laughs> question in the world. Uh, he just talked about himself. And I, I identified. And he told me, he left me with hope. And he helped, he helped me understand a little bit that I had alcoholism. And I didn't fully understand all that then, but it, it was just enough to like, oh man, so this is it. And basically what he said was when you start drinking, you can't stop. And that you're different than a normal alcoholic or normal drinker. And that we've got a mind that tells us it's okay to do it. And the way he described it was when you touch a hot stove and it burns you, you're probably not going to touch it again. You probably would, Larry. But, but most people won't. <laughs> and uh, when it comes to drinking, that piece is missing in our mind that we'll get burned or get hurt and we'll go back to it. And it made sense to me. And I was like, yeah, I got that. And what, what, what would happen to me is that I would be introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous soon after that. And I was introduced to our literature I was introduced to the big book and was told that the solution to, our, to my problem is, is in, the, in the big book and that the instructions for the steps are in the book. And I was introduced to um, you know, a group and the con then sponsorship. And what, what happened to me was I, I, didn't, I didn't know that any of that stuff was like an option. I mean, it was like, I mean, it was just like, said, this is what you do. And I was like, okay. And even, even silly things like, you know, God told me that if you had cancer, you would, and they, the doctor prescribed a treatment for you, you would probably show up for the treatment. And now this sounds dramatic now, but he said alcoholism is just as deadly and that it's just as serious. And that this is the treatment for alcoholism. It's the 12 steps and the meetings and the fellowship. And that if you really want to save your life, then you'll do this. And I took that seriously. I never, I, I still do today. I just, I, it just wasn't an option for me. And what happened, and I don't, sometimes when you hear people talk, it's like they came in the program and just, shoo, everything's just perfect. And they did everything perfect. It sounds like that, but that is not at all what happened. Um, but I had, you know, I was like a lot of other people. I had all kinds of things not going well for me. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any money. My wife is off doing stuff. She ain't coming back. I thought for sure that she would come back because I was getting sober. I didn't have anywhere to live. And I had to live in my, in my dad's living room for a little while. It was awful. I mean, I'm grateful. Don't misunderstand me. I am grateful that he, that she let me in there. <laughs> But, you know, you're walking on, thin ice, walking on ice and tiptoeing around and sharing bathrooms and all that stuff. With, it's just awful. And uh, uh, I stayed there for a little while, and she, my stepmom finally said, you got to get out of here. And uh, the, their option was she owned a daycare. And uh, she said, then you can stay at the daycare. And I was like, okay. Well, the thing about the daycare was it stunk like Baby di dirty diapers. <laughs> and I, there was this back room in it that I could stay in, but I had to like be out before six in the morning because there was like some violation of state law that nobody can stay in a daycare. And especially with, when the kids get in, you couldn't, I couldn't come back in until the, uh, but I was grateful to be at the daycare. It was way better than the Oxford house and the, uh, Living with, living with all those guys. Um, and, but more importantly, I say that because, you know, a lot of people don't have people that support them or help them when they get sober, and I did. And I'm, 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 I'm actually grateful for that. And no one ever told me that 
and we're not going to help you, or they never told me that you're not an alcoholic, and maybe you should go do something different. I mean, people just helped, tried to help me, and my, and my family did for the most part. Most importantly was I took the steps, and I, you know, I, I took the first nine steps in about eight weeks. I didn't finish the ninth step in eight weeks, but I, I wrote an inventory and did a fifth step at about five weeks sober, and I started to make amends at about seven, eight weeks sober. And those were things that I never thought I was going to be able to do. It just looked, it just looked too scary to me. Um, but I found out that I had done a poor job running my life when I did that first, fourth, and fifth step. And that maybe there was a better way. And I also realized that most of the people that I had thought had wronged me had really done nothing but try to help me. And that I'm the one that probably wronged them. And as I made some of those amends to family members, and particularly one to my grandma, you know, I, like I made an amends to my grandmother, I, did, I was certain, this sounds absurd now, and you hear people say, oh, I was certain she didn't know any of these things that I had done. <laughs> well, I told, she knew every one of them. I mean, it's, and looking back, I went, of course she knew every one of them. And, uh, but, but, you know, those amends would go well. And... You know, what happened was I started to realize that I could stay sober. I was sober about 90, about three months, and I realized that the obsession to drink and kind of the, whatever that is, it was gone. And it's never returned. Now, I'm not naive to think that it can't return. I, I believe if I stop doing certain things that slowly, I'll get sick slowly over time, and the, the obsession to drink might come back. Matter of fact, it probably will come back. Um, and you know what I can tell you is that that um, I got the the I guess the trust of my family back because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got the trust of some of the the members of that community. Not completely. Some of them still don't believe I'm sober. <laughs> uh, <laughs> back because of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I started getting involved. I mean, the group I got into first, I mean, we, they immediately sent me to the mental health meeting in Smithfield. I was sober about three months. We immediately started going into Harnett County Correctional, or Harnett Correctional, and it, it's funny, you know, now you gotta be sober a year or more and go through all this process. I swear, we just, we just started going in there. I don't, I mean, I don't remember a whole lot of, uh, of, of stuff to get in there. Um, but I've been doing that work ever since. I mean, I've just, I mean, I, I've continued to try to, to, to be of service to people that, that don't have access to meetings and the, the program like we do. And we're just taught that's what we do. That that's, you know, that's the service. And my wife came back after about nine months sober. We tried to make it work. We moved to Rocky Mount. Um, I, I was about two years sober, maybe not quite two years sober. And we, we moved to Rocky Mount. And back, and back then it was, it was just before everybody had cell phones and there was like mass communication. Everybody communicated. It was back then you, you couldn't use the phone when you were at work, right? You couldn't use the work phone and if you called your sponsor, you'd call and you would leave a message and he may or may not call you back that night. Typically they would. Um, but anyway, I moved here and I was, yeah, I was told to get a new sponsor. There, even then, a whole lot of like long distance sponsorship didn't happen. And so I lived over here on Sunset, what was the name of his apartments page? Do you remember? Sunset Boulevard, anyway, it's a worthless story, but. I struggled getting connected to Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I went to meetings, and I was here for three or four, five, six weeks, and couldn't find anybody to sponsor me. And I went to a meeting one night, and it was, I don't, it was downtown somewhere. I don't remember what group it was, but it met in the basement. And it was a room about the size of this, but it had these big columns in it. And I'm sitting there, and it was some kind of discussion meeting, and this guy, it was Paige, this guy starts talking, but I couldn't see him because of the call. 
And his message was completely different than anybody else in the room. And his message was completely just like what I came from and, and Dunn and Coates and Smithfield. And I was like, man, I got to talk to that guy. Well, after me, I went up and talked to him, told him that I you know, was new in town and all that. And he said, well, we got to, I got to, we got to get you away from these meetings here in Rocky Mount. It's, <laughs> it's just the truth. You, you all can take offense to it if you want to. This is just what happened. And he says, my home group's in Wilson. He says, principal's group, he says, he says, I'll pick you up tomorrow and we'll go. And I'm thinking, and he was all like well put together and, and he was like buff back then, all tan. <laughs> and, and he, he was a specimen. I mean, really, he, in a good way. And so I'm thinking, man, he's going to pick me up in a daggone like Porsche or a Mercedes or I look out, I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting for him to come get me, and he, he pulls up, I see this big old Buick station wagon go up, and, uh, and then Squirrel Man found me. And, uh, and he, anyway, I get in the car with him, he's like, we start driving to Wilson, and he asked me if I was hungry, I was like, yeah, I'm hungry. I'm thinking steakhouse or something. He pulls into this, there used to be these restaurants called Scats. I don't know if anybody remembers them, but it was just a, it was like a, a miniature Hardee's. And we pull into this Scats, and we get out, and we're going, I'm like, man, what's this? He said, we're going to go get some hot dogs or something. And so we get there, and he like walks behind the counter and starts like talking to people and telling people what to do. And I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> he worked for the company. And I don't know, there was a light bulb burned out somewhere, and he was like telling them to fix the light bulb. And, um, but anyway, we, we got to uh, the principal's group, and it was, it was like the group I had left. And I joined that group, and um, well, not long after I asked Paige to sponsor me, and he's been sponsoring me ever since then, uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, and while I was living here was when my wife figured out that she liked other guys more than she liked me. And uh, we, uh, we ended up getting divorced. And around that same time, I, I, I'd, I'd stolen money, some money from work sober. And um, went back and made amends to that, for that. And because of good sponsorship and people in the, in the program that have experience with stuff like that, I was able to get through all that stuff without drinking. And I was able to get through that with, with some dignity and um, you know, just by doing the right thing and, and uh, basically applying and practicing the program as it's written in our literature. And I... Um, not long after that. After all that, I kind of decided I wasn't going to... I had sworn women off forever. And um, I realized that after going through that divorce and, and the deal with the money at work, I, never, I didn't get fired from that job. I, I can't explain it today. We had fired a lot of people for less than what I'd done. They, they kept me on. And I... Um, it's like right when I got over my resentment at women, Sarah, Sarah like popped up out of the floor and um, we got, I don't know, we messed around with for a couple years and got married. And uh, we got married at her sister's house in, in Macclesfield. And my brother, who I impersonated in the hospital after that second suicide attempt, <laughs> Uh, he's a preacher. He became a preacher, and he was in, he was living in Afghanistan. I think that's right. And um, he he like I didn't know he was coming. They had arranged this. He showed up and married us. He like flew in from Afghanistan. I don't know how if, if he parachuted in on some CIA <laughs> helicopter or what happened. But um, Paige and my dad were like co best men and. Um, you know, we've been married ever since. I, um, and not long after that, I've gotten this call. When I got out of the Air Force, 
I swore I was never going back to Fayetteville. Now, now listen, there's nothing wrong with Fayetteville. It gets a bad rap by people. I love Fayetteville. But I was never going back to Fayetteville. I, I didn't like it. It was the cause of everything that happened to me. And um, I got a call one day from my boss saying, hey, we got a job we want you to consider. I'm like, okay, where? It's in Fayetteville. I was like, oh. I was like, I didn't even think about this. And basically it was one of them deals, well, yeah, we'll give you a day to think about it. And I called Paige and he said, well, it must be some work for you there to do. Now, the Air Force was actually on my men's list. I don't know how you're making amends to the Air Force. Um, but if you paid taxes back in the mid-'80s and late-'80s, I apologize. You didn't get your money's worth out of me when they, when I, when they, when they, when they, when they paid me. But, um, and Sarah wasn't real happy about moving to Fayetteville, but she agreed. So we split the difference, and we kind of we moved like Lillington Anger and, but anyway, I had this job in Fayetteville. It was actually a pretty big job with this company that I was working for. And I was like a, you know, the, almost like a little lo local celebrity in the town and had access to like money and it wasn't mine, um, but had access to money and resources and people. And we were trying to get the cell phone business off the ground and building out networks and stuff. And it was, it was a great time to be in that business. And I was actually able to like do stuff in that community with the Boys and Girls Club and some homeless stuff um, that were only available because I was sober and, and had tried to do the right thing. One, one day this guy asked me to speak at this halfway house in Fayetteville. And I agreed and I went and spoke at this, at this halfway house. And after the meeting, this guy comes up to me and he says, you were in the Air Force? I was like, yeah. He's like, well, I'm in the Air Force and uh, Pope Air Force Base has started this program for folks with alcohol and drug problems. When I was in the Air Force, they didn't have any programs like that. If you, if you admitted to any of that, they'd lock you up or they'd kick you out. I mean, they, they didn't have an alcohol or drug problem. That was just their stance. And it was really scary. But anyway, the, he asked me if I'd come speak on Pope Air Force Base. And I was like, yeah. So I was able to go back and speak to this group and actually help some of those guys that were just consumed with fear about revealing you know, what, they, what they were doing. And it was, pretty, it was pretty powerful. I also, I was in the Air Force for four years and never flew on an airplane. Now that's... <laughs> It's pretty difficult to accomplish. <laughs> and I always regretted never flying on a, on a military plane. Well, I, we, 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 the company I worked for, we did some other stuff for the military there, and they, the commander of Pope Air Force Base found out, and he called me one day and asked me if I wanted to fly on a military mission. And I said, heck yeah. So they, they let me fly on a KC-10 tanker and fuel, refuel an A-10 up in the, in the air. Nice. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty powerful. And um, you, can't, you can't have experiences like that sitting at home watching Jeopardy. <laughs> I mean, you just, you just can't. You can't have an experience like that, you know, hiding out somewhere. And, you know, that's... That's what Alcoholics Anonymous has given me is it? I mean, my, my wife, my life appeared to be over and ruined. And because of Alcoholics Anonymous and the power of God that I found through the steps and through people that it's taken that wasted and busted life and has given it some purpose. And it has given some meaning. And, you know, I've been able to, to just basically to grow in Alcoholics Anonymous and to, to try to just be of service. And, you know, most importantly, I mean, I, the, the program has given me purpose and it's helped me to become free. And Tom Iverson used to say it a lot that he was the, the, the kind of the freest man that he knew. And I can tell you tonight, man, I, there's a lot going on in my life, but I'm absolutely free uh, of, of, of as free as anybody I know. And I'm not tied to any of that stuff because I've found the power of God in Alcoholics Anonymous. So thank you.